so we are on facebook right now okay. yes sir okay so good evening uh, to all the viewers uh, i am saurabh koshal from smart circuits innovation private limited your moderator So today uh, we have uh, two a uh, very great or a distinguished uh, guest with us, and everyone is you know waiting for this particular day especially. So today, uh, apart from the talk, uh, we are going to announce the name of a student innovation challenge 2020 organized by uh, Smart Circuits Innovation Private Limited, and we have a mentor uh, from uh, NASA's STEM Innovation Lab, Mr. Troy. uh mr mitul dikshit who is the president of uh, international space society so let me uh, give you a brief uh, introduction so uh, firstly um, namaste to mr troy from india oh uh, thank you thank you it's it's such a pleasure pleasure to be here i'm excited and i loved my visit there and i loved meeting everybody the hospitality that i received while in india was just beyond anything i've experienced so it's it's a pleasure to be here with you today to share what i can thank you so let me give you, uh, let me give a, a brief introduction about mr troy and mr mitchell dikshit sir and after that we will start with the session and i'm sure uh, uh, i mean a lot of uh, students parents are waiting for this particular session today so uh, mr troy decline is the director of the nasa steam innovation lab in the godard space uh, flight research center in united states of america and he is responsible for all areas of lab design development and operation and he is also the education and technology lead for nssec and he's having a wonderful uh, you know stem innovation lab uh, in in us at agora space flight research center and that lab is uh, you know uh, the consist of all the latest technologies uh, whether it is a 3d printed technology virtual reality electronic sensors so all this type of latest technologies are present in our, our steam innovation lab uh, in the nasa steam innovation lab which is uh, directed by mr troy and on the another hand uh, we have again a very uh, famous personality uh, mr mitul dikshit ji uh, he is the president of international space society is the chairman of uh, uh, dikshan group of school and he's also the person behind uh, dikshan satellite one that is a high altitude balloon satellite uh, which was launched by the student of dikshan school last year in uh, march 2019 um, so today uh, we have both the guest with us and uh, we will discuss uh, about the steam innovation we will discuss about the space technology and innovation and how youngsters how students can be the part of uh, innovation and what exactly can they can do uh, with the help of a think lab or a innovation lab if we can provide all this type of a tools to our students and in addition to that i request our mitul sir uh, as the president of uh, international space society to please uh, you know uh, ask a few questions from mr troy who's um, the guest uh, today and at the end of uh, this session we will also announce the name of uh, the winners of student innovation challenge 2020 and i request all uh, to all our viewers if you have any question you can write down your questions in the comment section of the facebook and please like and subscribe and share uh, this particular session so over to you and uh, please uh, study this session sir uh, hi troy good so good to have you uh, in this conversation and uh, thank you saurav and smart circuit uh, innovation private limited for getting us together and uh, let me tell you troy i've been uh, watching your live streams every day almost every day every thursday uh, i think thursday you you live streaming and uh, you have made the most of this lockdown or is it is it the lockdown in us because it's yes, it is. more of you know reaching out to and 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 let me tell you that all this is reaching india because of a huge fan following you have in india through your facebook and through your social network i mean this this fan following comes just uh, during your visit for you know almost a week or 10 days time in india and uh, i mean imagine you know uh, the the kind of people who are who are who are associated with you on your on your social networks and were able to you know ex uh, have access to all that all the live streaming thank you so much you know for because that 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 gives us all an opportunity to have an insight of the kind of work which is being done uh, at your steam lab and uh, the the kind of you know uh, uh, opportunities which are being created from this uh, steam lab 
so uh, would you like to uh, troy would you like to start with you know uh, introducing uh, the nasa steam lab and Inno innovation lab and uh, uh, maybe briefly touch upon it absolutely and uh uh, how much, actually, let me ask before I, I do that, how much time would you like me to uh, talk about the lab? Just a few minutes and just kind of introduce what it is or? Yeah, you uh, can go into details. I mean, we have a sufficient would, time and after that, yeah, we will take a question from a student and you can go ahead. No, no issue about the timeline. Okay, now. okay. Yeah. And uh, I do have, uh, I do have some slides that uh, while I was in India, uh, you may have seen uh, a talk, that, uh, many of you may have seen a talk that I did and I have some beautiful images and uh, pictures that if you want for maybe, uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, or a little longer with questions, I'd be happy to share some of those with you. And I believe all I have to do is just share a screen. Will that be okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right now I'll hit uh, share screen. I'm getting ready to start with this. And I always know there's a little bit of delay sometimes, but it looks like uh, this started right up for so uh, that that's good. Uh, but again, my name is Troy Klein and I'm from, I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'm the director, as they said, of NASA's new STEAM Innovation Lab. And we are so excited uh, about this program. We've been building the lab now for, I think, five years. And we, it's, we started five years ago with the actual uh, building of the lab that you see behind me at NASA. And it was, oh, we, I just realized when I was talking to Saurabh, I met him uh, in 2013. And I was at the, we were at the World Maker Fair and you were sent there uh, with a contingent of people to explore new and different innovative ideas. And you happened to come to my talk at the World Maker Fair about the STEM, or STEAM Innovation Lab and about my work at that time, which was with a mission called MMS. So uh, before I go too far into that, I'd like to walk through some of the reasons why we created an innovative makerspace at Goddard Space Flight Center in the first place. And it might surprise you as to the reasons why we built it. Some people think it's just because NASA is very technical um, and we are, and that we're into engineering and technology and all of that, and we really are. And that is part of the reason, but the bigger part of the reason has to do with something more personal uh, to me than that. It has to do with passion about why we want to learn the things we learn, why we want to explore the universe that's around us. And uh, for many of the people that I work with at NASA, they, they started becoming engineers and scientists and technicians and educators. And uh, in, in every job at NASA, they started becoming those things because of something normally an experience that they had in their past. And the slide that you're looking at right now is a really special slide to me, and I've shared it many times with people in places in the world. And this is a star field that uh, was taken by an amazing telescope um, that is from Hawaii on top of Mauna Kea on a volcano in Hawaii. And it's called uh, CFHT, which, uh, and it, it's a series of, uh, of countries that came together and they built this telescope to be able to look as deep into space as they, they reasonably could with their optics. And this picture you're looking at is just a small, small pick piece of a picture that they took of space that's much, much bigger. But this particular picture um, that is part of the greater picture stunned everyone, including the large deep field image that they took. So let me explain what this is. They took a, every day, they took a small, tiny little, tiny piece, a picture of space um, that eventually covered a region of space somewhere around the size of the moon. And that's it. I mean, just that one dark piece of space. And they were stunned with the images after they pieced it all together and received all the data. It took them two or three years to compile all of this data. They were stunned with what came back. What came back in the main image wasn't, you didn't just see stars and a few, few stars and planets and maybe a few galaxies, but there are half a million, 500,000 galaxies and objects, celestial objects in the image that came back. And uh, it, was, it was a moment like that that actually changed my life. When I was a little boy, about three, four years old, my grandmother took me out onto the farm and she was, a, they were farmers, my family. 
and uh, she pointed up to the sky and showed me a picture and showed me uh, the moon and taught me how to say moon for the first time. And from that point on, and I saw this brilliant nighttime sky, uh, that one, that really affected me to the point that I knew that it was something that I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life. Let's see if I can uh, go past that. So experiencing that moment for many people is incredible, but for my, my particular boss that I work for, his name is Dr. Alex Young, and you see him in the bottom right-hand corner of this picture. And what he's looking at with the, this childlike expression is an eclipse that happened uh, just about a year, about a year, year and a half ago. And he had never seen a total solar eclipse. And I don't know if you've seen eclipses uh, or you, if where, you, where you live or if you've traveled in a region to at least see an eclipse. But what happens is the moon covers the sun entirely for a period of time, depending on where you are. And the sky goes completely almost twilight, almost like it's just getting ready to turn dark. And you can actually see stars in the nighttime sky and, and the daytime sky right behind where the sun's light used to be. And it is life-changing for a lot of people who experience that to the point that many of the people who experienced that uh, ended up becoming astronomers and, uh, and going into space and technologies and all of it. And as, uh, actually looking at the nighttime sky is what inspired me to eventually work in a place like NASA. It made me ingest anything that I could, any space toy, any, any piece of information, any innovation that I could find. For the rest of my life, I begged my parents to buy for me so that I could play with it, learn about it. And I used to pretend as a child that I was in spacecraft all the time. I, when I would be in a car, I would pretend that it was the space shuttle <laughs> or a rocket. And it was just the way I played. And I just loved all of that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, it was pretty incredible. Now, the picture you're looking at right now is, is a picture of where I was invited to go to a little island in the South Pacific that was about 2,000 miles from the nearest land mass. It's a tiny little island with about 500 people. And uh, that island was called Walleye. And we went there with the Exploratory Museum in, in San Francisco because uh, when uh, when they were working on what they were doing, they had the funding to go and film a total solar eclipse that was just about ready to happen and go over that island. And uh, while I was there, I had a moment where I met one of the eldest tribal chiefs. As we, we took little boats and went up to the island shore, we met uh, several of the chiefs from the island chains. And the elder one that you see me kneeling to, uh, before, he, uh, I'm handing him an eclipse braille map. It's a tactile map of what it feels like through your fingers, if you're blind, where you can experience what an eclipse, the mechanics of an eclipse. You can feel the moon and the sun and the path of the eclipse. I took his hand and I rolled it across the map and he was very serious and very, very stoic and very quiet at first. But the expression you see on his face is the joy and laughter that came out of him when he realized and they translated what, what he was seeing through his hands for the first time. That changed my life. That made me not only want to explore technology, but become innovative in how we can help people even more, especially people with assistive technology needs where you're visually impaired, hearing impaired, paraplegic, uh, you name it, dyslexia, colorblindness. Uh, we try to incorporate that type of thinking into universal design principles as we develop ideas in the lab that I'm going to get to. And just a second, I want to tell you all about the lab and, and we can ask some questions. Um, this uh, image that you see right now is taken from a place in uh, uh, Hovenweep, New Mexico. It's an ancient Indian Anasazi uh, ruin. Um, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And this entire group of people that used to inhabit the southwest of the United States uh, mysteriously seem to have wandered off or disappeared or left. They think it might have been because of drought. They're not sure, but we have all the remains and all of the, the relics that they left behind and the ruins. And these people were so in love with astronomy and space and innovation that the houses, as we discovered, were built in alignment with the sun and the moon and the stars. And the shadows that would be cast throughout the day cast shadows on markers throughout the land and throughout their area to mark birthdays, celestial events, equinoxes, solstices. And uh, there was one in particular that I was able to climb down into a large uh, crevasse or crack in rocks. And they pointed it out to me. And I, I sat there early one morning, and it was on the equinox. 
and two daggers of light as the sun came up appeared from the left and the right and started moving across and touched right like fingers in the center on that day. And I watched it happen and it pierced peckings and called petroglyphs in the rock that were spirals that you see faintly in the background. It went right through them, right through the centers of them and created a beam of light. Um, that is what that looked like when the shaft lit up the rock in front of me. Now, what's interesting about that is I had that moment. I felt for that moment, I was connected not only to the, the beauty I saw in front of me, but I, I was connected to the whole universe. For one moment, the mechanics of the universe that we live in caused that phenomenon to happen in front of me, just like clockwork. And it connected me. Suddenly, I felt connected to the bigger picture. And I wanted to learn how to take that experience and share it uh, with people anywhere I go and around the world. These are the people who are involved in that. These are uh, uh, Cherokee astronomers, and uh, they have their doctorate in astronomy and also in knowledge holding uh, in their tribes. So we have Cherokee uh, represented and also Navajo. And these are the people who taught me about the petroglyphs, the rocks, and the alignments of the stars and the sun and the moon uh, during that entire experience. And they have their own star stories. They created a map that you see in the upper right of what it looks like through Navajo eyes and their view of the sky. Instead of seeing Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, their constellations are very different that they identify so that they know which region of sky they're talking about. Now, here's the important part. We want to learn how to explore, explore that moment. And it's very important to be able to do that and to be able to bring experiences and moments from around the world to people. But the picture you're looking at right now is of something that we took very seriously in the Steam Innovation Lab. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Uh, this is the aurora, the northern lights. So if you ever go to the very far regions of the, of the earth, in the United States, it's Alaska uh, and Canada. Sometimes at night, you look up and the sun it has, is being very active. It has explosions and coronal mass ejections quite often in space. And when those explosions reach the earth, if it comes in our direction, it, ac it activates an entire uh, cascade of events that happen in space around us. Our magnetic field that surrounds the Earth actually shakes and is impacted and generates power, electricity, that goes into the north and south pole of the Earth, which activate the molecules in our, in, in our atmosphere, in at the atoms, and uh, it turns, nitrogen becomes uh, electrified, really, and it swells up in its atomic state. And to go back to its natural state lets off violet light and lets off uh, like blues and oxygen when it hits oxygen, oxygen will eventually light up and it lets off green colors and red colors. And it creates these beautiful waves and patterns uh, in the sky. Now, um, I'm, I'm concerned about playing any videos because sometimes I think through Zoom, they become choppy. So I'll be very careful with that and I'll be sure to share. I think if you go and you see the TED talk that I'm referring to right now, the TEDx talk I did in India, you'll see this video. Um, but this is an Atlas V rocket because eventually I had a, another moment with thousands of people that inspired even more creativity at NASA and more reason why we wanted to create a makerspace and a steam innovation lab so that we could bring people's passion of making into this whole experience that we've been having in different places in the world. This Atlas V rocket is what carried a spacecraft called MMS, the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission into space. And, uh, that spacecraft is, is a mission that I worked on, and it's one of those missions that um, four spacecraft were packed into the top of that rocket uh, that are 12 feet wide, four feet high apiece with 26 instruments aboard each one, individualistic instruments, to go and capture in three-dimensional data a magnetic reconnective event where the magnetic field of the sun and the magnetic field of the Earth collect, connect, collide, rip apart, and they blast particles faster than anything we've ever seen, the biggest particle accelerator in the known universe. And it uh, is in a tremendous amount of power. It tells us a lot about magnetism and the power of magnetism that one day if we can harness uh, the energy levels that we could create cleanly through magnetism, it would be extraordinary. So this spacecraft is currently, these four spacecraft are circling the earth right now talking are looking at that phenomena, capturing it when it happens and these magnetic explosions happen, they capture it and send the data down to earth and we study it and they're studying it right now uh, all the time. 
And that that is, I'm meeting people from that mission all the time who tell me stories of their instruments, of the technology and the engineering and science that they are so passionate about and their entire lives are devoted to capturing this data and to increasing the knowledge of mankind and trying to make our lives on this planet better. Uh, we have satellites and scientists studying global warming and climate change and uh, hurricanes and earth science and the oceans and you name it. And there are scientists at NASA, I'm sure, are involved in people with other people and agencies like European Space Agency and India's Space Agency uh, to try to understand these phenomena. And that's something I have to tell you. And then I'm, I want to tell you about uh, a project some students created that inspired the STEAM Innovation Lab. Now, when I go to work, I don't just see um, people that look like me and sound like me. Um, I see people from all over the world, from every region of the world that is there. We have people that come to us who have embraced engineering and science and they, they worked in schools uh, like the ones that, that you're going to now and with the innovative people that are online right now who are creating experiences for, for, you, for you and this challenge that we've talked to that you've embraced uh, these people are inspiring you to do these challenges, not because it's just really fun, which it is, and that's incredible, it's a big part of it, but it's because they know that if you do this and you can embrace it and it, it ignites your passion, that you'll be able to become an engineer or a scientist or a technician or a mathematician or an artist that can help us recreate these experiences in a visual context so that people around the world can understand what it is that space science and, and earth science is trying to understand. Now, uh, this picture that you're looking at right now uh, really is the beginning of why I started thinking about, with a team of people, the development of a makerspace. Okay. Uh, you see the rocket in the left-hand side of the image. That is the, uh, the rocket that took the right. magnetospheric multi-scale satellites into space that I just told you about. Um, and there, were, there was a group of students from the, the small state in West, a uh, small town in West Virginia uh, that came to Goddard Space Flight Center where I work and they took a tour of Goddard and they saw the clean room where they build the satellites. And they came up to me and talked to me and their teacher. And they said, we're, we know we're a small school. We don't have many resources, but with your help, we would like to turn our one of our classrooms and, and areas of our school into a giant makerspace and we would like to create a replica of one of the uh, magnetospheric multi-scale mission spacecraft that you told us about. So the spacecraft that you see being built right there, are, it's made out of, the students built their version out of uh, plywood and just different kinds of wood and they made the shape of the spacecraft which is an octagon. They placed solar panels around the outside of it that you see and uh, that, that were donated to the school. And then eventually the students recreated the entire replica with the replica instruments uh, out of bleach bottles and out of 3D printed parts and out of wires. And they brought it to Goddard Space Flight Center and we displayed it in the bottom right at, at the center for 10,000 employees. We, we displayed it there for three months. And one of the students that was part of the project, uh, she came to the project at her school not able to speak. She had gone through trauma in her life. And sometimes when you go through severe trauma, uh, people don't speak anymore. Even if they want to, it just will not come out. And it's, uh, I think it's called being a select mute. You can speak physically, but somehow from the trauma, you're not able to get the words out. So this, this girl had gone through this. And uh, when she started working on this project that you're looking at, she so desperately wanted to be an engineer and part of it that she slowly began to write phrases down, to communicate with her, her colleagues. And then she started speaking one word at a time or two and, and quietly and humbly and eventually sentences, paragraphs. By the end of this project, it took them a year. She was the one who presented the project to me and she was talking all the time. And it was amazing because her, her passion for engineering and technology is what ignited her moment and that changed her life, just like it can change yours. Uh, Sarab, I'd like to pause for just a moment. Um, I'm getting ready to talk for just a few minutes about the STEAM Innovation yeah. Lab. Sure. Uh, do you have any questions or comments before I do that? I will ask uh, later on. First, you can complete this, and after that, we'll ask the questions. 
Okay, that sounds great. I hope people are enjoying this. I'm changing it up yeah. from what I said before because yeah. uh, I really, I've had many, many more experiences at Goddard Space Flight Center in the lab than um, since, I, since I met all of you in India. So I'll share a few of those uh, while we go. Now, it looks like I'm sitting you know, in the lab right now, but because of COVID-19, uh, the United States, most of the United States is on lockdown, just like I uh, believe where you, with, with you. And um, they're, they're working with scientists and medical personnel and staff around the world, which again, we're talking about science and technology and mathematics and engineering uh, and, and all, of, all of STEAM uh, to find a vaccine and to find treatments uh, to help us combat COVID, even if they don't, if before they find the vaccine, we hope they can find some treatments. And uh, of course, NASA is very concerned about this. It's affecting all of, all of NASA as well, where most all of us are working from home right now. And uh, what's interesting is uh, we've never been in a situation that I know of where the entire United States uh, and, and the entire, all, most of NASA uh, is all working from home, uh, but it's working. It's, we're actually like everyone else, we're, we're teleworking, uh, we're communicating safely with each other. There, people are continuing their projects. Uh, there are in the government, like with you, I'm sure there are a select few that have to be uh, on location to make certain things continue to happen so it doesn't completely fall apart while we're gone. But the, they've been very careful with trying to get make sure people are safe. And so I took a picture of the lab before I left and I placed it behind in my in Zoom. And this is a virtual background behind me of, of the lab where I work. And uh, I'm going to explain all the pieces and parts of the lab right now. And it and it's really wonderful because as I described the lab at Goddard Space Flight Center, it also is at the same time in a way describing the innovative labs that are starting to appear in India through the work that people online are doing, uh, which is so impressive in, in, in schools in areas throughout, throughout India. And uh, the reason it's happening that way and because it's so similar is because uh, Sarab and his group uh, when they came and visited and talked with me those many years ago, took the idea back and found the funding and worked with the right people uh, that you see here and online and uh, with us. And they were able to start building and creating your own version of the STEAM Innovation Lab. And while I was in India, uh, gosh, it's been a little while now. It's not even, I don't think it's been a year, but uh, it's been just a little while. Um, I was able to visit two of those labs and I was so inspired because they look so similar to the lab that I have at Goddard Space Flight Center and to the labs that we're getting ready to inspire people to build throughout the United States and other regions of the world. I was so inspired by that, by what I saw in India and how beautiful it was and how, how knowledgeable the students in those labs were with, and the questions that they asked uh, were some of those questions, I'm an education technology specialist, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I have a lot of information that I've been learning that I've, I've done and had and received in those areas, but my specific uh, specialization is education with a technology uh, emphasis. So I had students asking me questions that I hear scientists at, and engineers at NASA ask each other, it's on that level, and it, I was just blown away and which just I was so uh, shocked and amazed and excited at the same time uh, with the questions I was getting. So for the questions that I couldn't answer because they were it had to do with some real technical uh, some issue they were working with on a project and but I was aware of I said I, I know the person you talk to talk to and we have engineers at NASA of course and yeah. I was able to connect them with one of or two, one or two of our engineers that work in my lab, who were able to work with them and answer questions and, and help them along with their project, and I'm able to do that also uh, with some scientists uh, and also and various careers and different uh, professionals at NASA. I can connect people online like we're doing right now uh, at times through um, Smart Circuits and through the work that I'm doing there with your group. Uh, two people yeah. so that they can, in India so that they can really receive that information. So the picture you're looking at is uh, me standing in the front. Uh, and this is our, I like to jokingly say, this is our Star Trek picture. This is our power. 
But uh, you see the people that work with me, uh, some of them are no longer there, um, some are new. Uh, we have a few newer people now on staff, but they are uh, the people who work on all of the different aspects of the lab that you see behind them. Now, on the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, there's a picture of our virtual reality specialist. His name is Brian Stevenson, and he's holding something that's called a merge cube, which is an augmented reality uh, little device. And it looks like what I'm holding in my hand right now. It's a, uh, let me put it in front of me so you can see it. But it looks like a little tiny box. And you can actually uh, go to that site if you need to, and you can download the paper version of this and make it out of paper. But what it does, it lets you through, you can hold your phone up and hold the, the object in front of you, take your cell phone and turn on this augmented reality program. And what I see in my phone when I do this isn't this block. It's actually, it looks like I'm holding and turning and playing with a spacecraft or the sun or whatever I want that object to be. And you can do the programming and create it and you can actually do it yourself. Uh, we'll be sending out some information soon from the lab uh, to share with people who haven't done this, uh, that they can actually create augmented reality experiences of their own and download some NASA spacecraft at the same time and do that uh, as, as long as you have one of these little cubes and, and a cell phone. Uh, so that's exciting. And so he's exploring virtual reality and augmented reality um, and different applications of space science. And, and it's amazing the work that he's doing. And he's getting ready to share that out. Uh, they're working on some virtual reality experiences that can be shared out to people who have VR equipment. Uh, in the the next picture over says virtual environments. We're exploring the idea in the lab of creating a gaming environment so that we can have people come into the lab and start seeing how we can use things, um, various games that are already out there and uh, online learning systems to create virtual NASA worlds of exploration. So we're really excited about that. I'm keeping my eye on several different uh, prototypes and programs that people are using to do that. Now, and in the center, you see a 2D, 3D printing image. That is one of the ladies that works in her lab. Her name is Shannon, or she works at Goddard. Her name is Shannon Reed. And she's an, uh, a project manager and admin support person. And she does at the same time. And she's holding a wooden, a laser cut uh, uh, image of the United States. And you'll see there's a small line right through the center of the United States. Well, in 2017, the United States experienced a total solar eclipse. And that is the path of the shadow of the moon that went across the United States. Now, we created 3D images of that experience as well, and of each state and region in the United States, and some uh, indigenous locations as well. I believe we also made one of Puerto Rico. And uh, what we did is you can place a hole, just punch a hole, a small pinhole, in the, in the center where your state capital is or where you're located or anywhere in that uh, little plate that you hold up. And during a total solar eclipse or during even a partial eclipse, you can hold uh, that little shape, your state or the United States or country up. And through the pinhole, the sun will shine through the pinhole and project an exact image of the eclipse that's happening and the sun onto the ground. And as a matter of fact, anywhere there's a pinhole, this phenomenon happens. It's like a pinhole projector. And if for those of you who have experienced partial or total eclipses, if you've been around trees or plants, um, as the sun is shining through those leaves, it creates little tiny pinholes of light sometimes. And on the ground, you'll see thousands of little lit up eclipses, little eclipse images all over the ground. It's like the most eerie and awesome experience uh, that you'll ever have. And it's inspired many people to go into different technology. Uh, to the right of, of, of yes, sir? Uh, yeah. To the right of, go ahead. Yeah, so, so already, I mean, uh, we have around a thousand plus questions or comments on our, this thing. <laughs> and uh, we have already reached around uh, 4,000 plus people and we have 350 plus views for this particular session right now. So we have a lot of questions uh, with us right now. Before that, you know, there was an interesting uh, uh, question put up by one of the kids. Is, yeah. there, any okay. planet, you know, is there any planet where uh, it rains diamonds? So... Is there oh, any you know? where it rains diamonds? And uh, what came into my mind was, uh, how is uh, 
the, the, the present government of United States, uh, what would be, I mean, uh, do you think there's going to be a massive cut in uh, the, the budgets uh, for uh, NASA? Uh, due to COVID-19, do you think, or is that why? Sorry? Or is that because, is the concern that there would be a budget cut because of COVID-19? Yeah. Or just... Yeah. Um, okay. um, actually, I, right now, um, and I'm, I'm not, of course, at the level at NASA headquarters sure. where I, I know anything about the budget, but I can say that I've heard absolutely nothing about a budget cut. As a matter of fact, um, there has been, from my understanding, uh, some increase to the budget over the past period of time because we're actually increasing what we're doing at NASA. Um, and one of the big projects we're getting ready to do that you may have heard of that's just been announced uh, that went out just recently is the selection of three companies and organizations that are going to work with NASA who will lead the Artemis project, which is the next lunar project of us going back to the moon and sending astronauts to the moon. So uh, that, by the way, is something I would encourage all of you to keep an eye on. And uh, Artemis, the name Artemis, um, is Artemis in mythology uh, was a twin sister to uh, Apollo. So if you remember back in the 50s and 60s, we had the Apollo missions. And uh, so they thought we're going back to the moon. So the twin, twin sibling of Apollo was Artemis. So they're calling it the Artemis Project. And there are so many wonderful things. I think SpaceX uh, has been uh, selected to be one of the organizations that's going to help us and work with NASA uh, to go to the moon. And Blue Origin is the other, and there's another uh, organization as well. And there are gonna be many, many thousands of people. And I'm hoping uh, that I can somehow be part of the Artemis project as we, as we go back to the moon. Now, I also want to answer that question with this. Um, when there's a crisis, like a pandemic, or, or there's something uh, happening to our oceans or to our atmosphere on the earth that is dangerous and it's, it's lethal and it can be really bad for mankind. Uh, places like space agencies and, and science agencies, they don't, they don't uh, step back and shut down. They step forward and step up to the task. So what they do is their passion is loving this universe, loving our planet, loving the earth and the atmosphere and everything that this brings to us. It is our only planet we can live on right now. Uh, it's the only one we're gonna get like this uh, and we have to take care of it. And so, so many thousands of people that work in these fields are passionate about that. So if anything, um, when these crises like this happen and health is in, in a part of it or the science, science can step in and make a difference and save lives, that's what these people are going to do, and they will find the funding any way they can to, to step up to the task and to further what we'd like to do as mankind, and, and not only to keep us knowledgeable, but to keep us safe and to keep us healthy. At NASA, we're not only thinking about the health and safety of people on Earth, you know, we're getting ready to venture back into space, and we have to know how to live safely in a space environment, which is, can be very hostile. Uh, people think it's just really quiet and there's nothing going on up there. But from the slides and things that I showed you a while ago, we're sending spacecraft into space to study the dynamics of ex you know, invisible magnetic explosions and radiation environments uh, that we couldn't possibly survive in <clears throat> unless we study them here on Earth and in situ by placing spacecraft and understanding it before we go. And, and that way we can do it as safely as possible <clears throat> and I remember um, with the Apollo missions, one of the launches that safely got to the moon and back, um, there were solar storms that happened. Um, but we were fortunate. We didn't know as much about space weather as we do now and about those explosions. We knew a lot, but not as much as we know now. And there were some solar storms that occurred <clears throat> before the launch. And then as they went, they orbited the moon and came back. And there was another one, there were others that followed, but I don't believe any of them happened, any strong storms happened while they were in space. Or that could have been, that could have been bad news for the astronauts. So we know a lot more and we're learning now how to try to live in those harsh environments. Sure. So uh, let us take a few questions from our viewers. I mean, we have more than thousand plus questions right now. 
so uh, the first question from uh, so we have 1000 plus questions and already we have reached up to 4000 reached and for 500 people are watching this particular uh, that's amazing i'm, I'm yeah, so right excited to, to so the meet all first of question is from ajit havan is that sir is it true that ufos are seen in usa no uh, uh yes so i'm going to say yes absolutely people are seeing a reporting that they're seeing ufos in the united states not only in the united states but they're seeing them around the world. Now, I want to qualify that. It doesn't mean that these are beings from outer space. Now, I, uh, it's often, often, as you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theories, lots of shows about UFOs and people's experiences with un unidentified flying objects, which just means we don't know what they are or when the person who saw that didn't know what it was. It could have been something from uh, the military, the Air Force, a science experiment. It could have been so many, many things. Um, and they investigate many of those to understand what the phenomenon was that they see. But there are thousands of people uh, in the United States who report every year uh, sightings like that. And, they, and they're taken seriously often, and, and they do investigate them uh, around. So yes, there are sightings. People do see, do see things they don't understand. Does that mean that it's um, a race or a being from another, another world? Um, I, I have heard nothing yet. Uh, in my level, I, again, I'm an education technologist. I'm not uh, studying UFOs in my lab, <laughs> but uh, I actually I have a lot of profound respect for people who have had these experiences. I, I have family members uh, who have seen my my dad, my grandmother, and different people that I know have seen and had different experiences where they saw a light in the sky that moved in an odd way, or they saw a light come down to Earth. Sometimes it's meteors if it's really fast, but other times it could be. Now, just think about this. We have drones right now that are doing multiple things. So if you imagine if you're way out in the country on a dark night and somebody was flying three or four drones in formation with lights and they're changing colors and form and they're zipping around and they look further away than they are, it's going to give you an experience that makes you think, wow, that could be a spacecraft from another world. Now, let me qualify this, though. I want to say something else about that. I have not met personally one scientist or person at NASA that I work with that doesn't believe life exists elsewhere in the universe. I think everybody that I've met, including me, I do believe life exists elsewhere uh, in the universe. I don't think we're alone, but I have no idea, of course, what that life looks like. And we are actually searching for signs of life on other planets and, and in the space around us. There are instruments um, that actually on Mars that check and they're doing soil samples and, and core samples where they drill down into the, the surface of Mars and analyze uh, data that they're getting to see if we can see that life ever existed on Mars and uh, or other worlds or in space. And uh, sometimes, you know, some interesting organic types of possibilities come back and they're puzzling that together now. I haven't heard anything yet that says absolutely definitively that we've discovered uh, the, the presence of life as we know it uh, on other worlds, but it's we're looking for it. And I think one day we will find evidence that uh, life has existed in space or, or does now. I know that one of the moons of Jupiter, they're very interested in exploring one of these days that beneath the icy surface of this, it might be Europa. I'm trying to remember which one it is, I believe it's that one. But if they can pierce the ice and send a type of craft to swim through that ocean <clears throat> that they're hoping that we'll find evidence of life there. So it's a great question. And uh, I yeah. think your generation of students coming up right now, I yeah. think uh, you may be among the first that is going to discover the presence of life uh, outside of Earth. I'm excited. I, I hope I'm still alive when that happens. So uh, the Vidya Dut Chatterjee is, uh, is uh, saying, uh, the Vidya Dut is your one of the biggest fan uh, in India, uh, so Vidya Devi Chatterjee is saying uh, right now oh, in the school. And I have another question from Priyanka Kumari. Uh, she is saying, uh, "Sir, please explain about parallel universe. Do you know about something related to a parallel universe? Whether the parallel universe exists or not?" You know, I I can tell you what I have heard. Enough. This is just through conversations that I've had uh, with various people and uh, astronomer friends of mine and people that work with us in the lab that I talk to all the time. And I'll tell you when I, it's so exciting. It's exciting where I, I have the pleasure of working because 
I, I, it's like working on Star Trek. I mean, it's because I, you, in Star Trek, you'll see um, that show, you'll see engineers and scientists, technicians of every being and race walking through, just chattering about the amazing things that, that's going on. And with the things that are allowed to tell me at my level, I have conversations with many of them, and I have had fun conversations about the theories of things like multiple universes, uh, parallel universes. And uh, there is some serious research going on right now uh, about those things. I know in science fiction, I've, I've watched a lot of shows and read a lot of books about parallel universes that every decision that you make, um, you, when you make that decision and you decide, yeah, I think I'm gonna turn left at that light instead of turning right. Well, when you turn left, the other you in a parallel universe turned right and a whole new universe is born. I mean, that's the sci-fi science fiction version of that. And it actually comes from uh, theories that people and astronomers and physicists and scientists have studied and quantum mechanics people. And, and, and people take that and they, they create amazing stories of science fiction out of that. Now that is not to belittle at all these theories and what people are creating in science fiction. As a matter, matter of fact, I'm a real advocate of science fiction and I'll tell you why. It's not because um, I think science fiction is just a bunch of fantasy made up nonsense. A lot of what science fiction is and which uh, does often come true down the road, not always, but often. If you look at uh, shows from the 1960s, especially in the 70s, of the future of space and of what we can do. And on Star Trek even, uh, there were things on those shows that people imagined and dreamed up based on some science that they'd heard or some engineering that they'd heard. And they, they come up with things like uh, medical scanners uh, that didn't exist yet, or uh, the types of rockets that SpaceX is developing with Elon Musk, those didn't exist yet. But when you go back into the 50s and look at those old science fiction shows, the uh, rockets that, that they're designing look so much like the ones from the 50s. And so when people have these theories like parallel universes um, and or multiple universes, I'm turning off my Siri that keeps coming on. Uh, those sometimes often, eventually they're either proven, sometimes they're not. Uh, and other times innovation is sparked out of those imaginations and those, those ideas that people come up with on their own and something in the future happens and, and it's realized and we find out we can we can do it and not only do what that person dreamed up 50 years ago, but we do it even better and we do more with it. So there are many, uh, there's a NASA spinoffs is something you should Google and look up. Just look, just type in Google uh, NASA spinoffs and you'll come across some websites and make sure it's a NASA site uh, when you get to it. Uh, there are many sites out there that aren't, aren't accurate, but the NASA sites are. And you'll be able to find uh, not only information about spinoffs and the spinoffs are basically ideas uh, that were created out of something that NASA did with other space agencies or by itself. Um, Velcro, for instance, was something that was used, was invented for astronauts so that they could easily just stick stuff to the walls uh, in a spacecraft where there's microgravity or no gravity. And uh, it eventually became something we use around the world every day. And there are hundreds and hundreds of those kinds of ideas. And I have to tell you, it might help your students to know that there are uh, groups within NASA who are exploring a really amazing futuristic ideas. And they see if they're viable. They, they come up with an idea. They're, they're trying them out in their own laboratories. And if the idea is viable, then it realizes this is something we could actually use now. And for I'll give you one idea. One idea was uh, a group of people came together and they're like, what if we could create 3D printers? Then this was, oh gosh, this was probably four or five years ago at least when I heard about this. And they said, what if we could create 3D printers that were also robots? So if you're in space on the space station or uh, another type of spacecraft or on the moon or on the surface of Mars, you could create robotic 3D printers that could walk like spiders to their location, use the regolith or whatever material they can from the planet or what is on board and create and make whatever is needed at that moment. Now, their thinking was, what if we created like a fleet of these and you, if something happened on the space station, for instance, it needed to be fixed or replaced, you just turn these 
these robotic 3D printers out and they crawl around the spacecraft, go to the region, print out what they need and create and fix and do whatever robotically. Now that is very futuristic thinking, but I was so excited when I heard that because I thought we aren't just working on the present, we are thinking about the future and the amazing things that we could do in the future. So I would, I would encourage all of you listening, um, when someone asks you about some crazy sounding idea that just sounds like something out of science fiction that couldn't possibly be true, don't laugh at that because those are often the ideas that inspire amazing innovations and inventions. And the STEAM Innovation Lab that we have, that we're working on, that I've been talking about, the whole point is for people like you to come into those labs and to use 3D printers, virtual reality, coding and electronics, paper cutting, and do something new and innovative with it that no one has ever thought of before. And I, I'm excited with what I'm already seeing coming out of our students. So uh, one question, you know, uh, you did talk about it and I would like to you to share it with uh, the, the viewers, what uh, got you into NASA? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'll have to tell you, um, the story that I shared with you at the beginning of the short presentation I did with my grandmother. I want you to share that. Uh, well, the, she, she took me out, you know, out to the nighttime sky as a three, four-year-old kid. And, uh, she was, what I saw in my grandmother was that um, she was so passionate about the world and the universe. She had her own problems. Living in her life where she grew up was very hard. She grew up in a place in the United States where uh, people were coal miners and they, would, they were miners and they would go look for coal. And it was a tough, rough life that they had. They had hardly any money and she, it was hard for them to even get the education that they needed. But that's where my dad grew up and he grew up with my grandmother and they had rough experiences. There was a lot of things and I'll have to tell you, and I think it's okay with my family to share this because I think it's inspiring. Where my family came from in those days, there were a lot of things that were so wonderful, but at the same time, they lived in conditions that were very, very bad, very rough. They were very poor and there was a lot of um, uh, abuse that went on uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. There was alcohol abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, you name it. And they, they experienced a lot of those horrible things that should have, when you think about what, what I heard they went through, uh, could have destroyed them. It, it could have been really, really bad for them. But because they had a, a beauty inside them and a light inside them and a passion for the stars at night and, and the forests that were around them and the beauty of nature and biology and the technology and the science that existed that they could get their hands on and see, uh, they used that and a lot of faith and they were able to make it out of that and not only make it out of it, but progress. And my grandmother eventually moved from West Virginia, moved to Ohio uh, and ran a farm. And she had many livestock, cows and chickens and pigs and corn and, and all of it. So uh, when I think of that type of experience that she had, they learn, my grandmother learned everything she could about how to grow corn and the right chemicals my grandfather used in order to make the corn grow better or when there was something wrong with the livestock, they had to use technology and medicines and different things they had to learn about in order to keep the farm alive and going. And because of that, they ended up learning uh, a tremendous amount about space. Hold on just a second. I have to put my, I have to plug my computer in. I just got an alert. Take me just a second. Yeah. So in the meantime, uh, Mittal sir, I have a question from you as, uh, okay. yeah, he's coming. Okay. Yeah, I'm right, I'm right there. Uh, let me end that little piece, but my grandmother, because of that excitement, I saw the passion and excitement in her face and the way she spoke about the stars and the moon. And I knew from that, that, that was really important. And it stuck with me. And when I looked up at the stars from then on, I, instead of just looking down and looking at my environment where I lived, at night, I would look up at the sky and I knew there was much more to my existence and to this experience of being alive than just what I knew where I lived. And, and even the bad, when I had a bad day, even growing up, 
at night, I would walk out and just lay on my back and go to a quiet, dark spot and look up at the sky and just let my brain drift and reconnect uh, that I'm part of this universe. As a matter of fact, I heard an astronomer, a wonderful scientist, her name is Michelle Thaler, and you should look her up if you, she's on science channels and she's on all over the internet, Michelle Thaler. And she talks about uh, how we are, we are actually made of stardust. My physical body is actually made from material that came from star formation and from the stars and from supernova and all of those materials that, the, that were created inside the intense presence of a star um, eventually that went out into the universe, coalesced, became the planets, became organic life, became all of it. And all the physical things that I see and feel that are my body actually are elements from the stars. So think about that when you're feeling bad about yourself, think about, you know, I'm, I'm more than just what's here, what people see. I'm actually stardust. I'm made of this universe. I belong here and I need to learn about it. So no matter how bad things get or how sad you get any day, just remember that. Go look at the stars and remember that's where you come from. You're special. So sir, we have a lot of questions related to a black hole. So uh, Mittal sir and uh, Troy sir, could you please uh, tell something? Actually, we have uh, more than 2000 plus questions right now. So uh, okay, we'll get to good. all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean, it would be good. I mean, if we can give the answers in a brief, and uh, so that we can take a maximum questions. Okay. So could you please okay. let us know more about uh, black holes? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about that. The, the, we have uh, several people at NASA who are working on understanding black holes even better. And as a matter of fact, one of these days, uh, I'm sure I could talk to a couple of those astronomers, and uh, if with future shows like this that we're doing, and I would be happy to bring them on with me and, and answer really intense questions. But with black holes, yes, there's a, there's a lot of study about the power of black holes and understanding them even more. And as you know, as many of you already know, our entire, our entire Milky Way galaxy is spiraling around a giant black hole that's in the center of our galaxy. And it provides an unimaginable power. Um, but yes, they are, there's quite a bit of study at NASA going on right now about that. So not only understanding just the black holes, but the dynamics of the energy that it takes uh, for a black hole to be uh, really created in the first place. And there are a lot of different theories about how that works, and, and they've made a lot of progress on that. So if you honestly type in NASA and black holes, you're going to find just countless pages and videos uh, of astronomers and NASA personnel talking about exactly that. So I would encourage you to do that. I do it all the time. So we have another question from uh, Anshu Madan. Uh, she's asking, do you want to become a scientist in your childhood also? You know, um, I did. I wanted to become many things in my childhood. I actually uh, wanted to become a doctor, a medical doctor for a while. And I changed my mind because I realized it involved blood and things that were kind of gross. And I thought, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. But uh, my sister became, she's a doctor. Uh, she has a doctor in administration and nursing. And so she went in that direction. That's her passion. I um, started getting uh, excited about um, science and engineering and, and especially technology from an early age because I, I had hoped one day we would be living on the moon by the time I'm my age and I would be inspired to be one of those people that would go live on a lunar environment uh, or in space. And we will get there. We're actually working on that now. I don't know if I'll be one of those people anymore because we only have so much time to live on earth, but <clears throat> absolutely, if I could, I would. So I, I went into, I uh, studied a lot of science. I studied a lot of engineering and mathematics in high school and also in my college and university years. <clears throat> but what really ignited the passion inside of me was education and educational technology, which is the study of taking things like 3D printers and Arduino, Raspberry Pi and virtual reality and not only using them as a tool, but using them better and in better innovative ways and coming up with innovative, innovative ways to use these technologies that we haven't thought of yet. And so that's exactly, that's what I'm doing now. And I'm, I'm trying to ignite the ideas and the power of the young and our youth and people around the world to go into innovation labs and, and create and just have a good time, play with it, explore it and see if you come up with the next great idea or an idea that might hint something that we already have in a much, much better way. And so I ended up doing that. So that's my, 
career path, educational technology. And uh, if you have a chance to go into that field, uh, there are many universities who focus on education technology. And NASA, of course, is very interested in that too. Okay. So another question I have from both of you, uh, from Mithul Dishis, the president of International Space Society in Troy. Uh, Lavkesh Mandiratta is asking, is it possible to develop a high altitude balloon satellite type, type project in an innovation lab? Yeah, we did it. You know uh, what? I, I should have you answer that question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, he's uh, asking, so Mithul sir and uh, Troy sir, uh, both of you having an uh, innovation lab. Uh, so could you please explain? Uh, yeah. Let me turn that over to Mitul right now, because I know that you all have done some work in that area already that has inspired me, so please. Yeah, uh, it's possible because uh, we did it last year. We developed a, a high altitude uh, balloon satellite and uh, smart circuits, in fact, uh, uh, has introduced, I mean, I'd I like, like to talk about, you know, how, how I know Saurabh and uh, the smart circuits. Uh, International Space Society, it's almost 10 years that uh, the International Space Society came in and we're in collaboration with uh, we're members of the National Space Society. That is one of the biggest space advocacy societies, uh, society in the world. And uh, they have uh, the International Space Development uh, Conference every year. And uh, one of the part, one of the things which I wanted to share with you, Troy, was uh, when we talk about space advocacy, I mean, I, I remember this session, you know, a couple of years back, uh, Larry Gower was the administrator, uh, NASA that time. I don't know whether you know him. Uh, I'm sure you know him. <laughs> I know of him. So, I mean, this all was full. And uh, I mean, since uh, NASA used to support, NASA was one of the sponsors of uh, the, the International Space Development Conference. And, uh, I mean, that hall used to be full of, you know, 80 year old women, men coming over, all space enthusiasts. And that was the year, you know, that, that started, I mean, they they decreased the budgets, I mean, uh, cut down budgets for NASA. And you could see them, you know, raising their fingers and loud voices about, you know, this whole nonsense of the, you know, uh, the, the, the government about, you know, cut downs in the NASA budget. So that is the kind of enthusiasm, you know, uh, which used to be there. And uh, coming back to that question about space, uh, uh, the, the, the balloon uh, satellite, yeah. satellite, high altitude balloon satellite, we became, I mean, uh, uh, since uh, 2010, when, when the International Space Society came in, uh, I think Saurabh and uh, his both, both uh, Sachin and, and uh, people from Smart Circuits, that time were doing the engineering. They were engineering students at, uh, uh, I mean, uh, an engineering college. And uh, that was the first conference because the International Space Society was also about space advocacy in India. And in particular to, to, to uh, one of the questions faced at one of the conference at uh, International Space Development at ISDC, was about, you know, what is the Indian government? How is the Indian government from the international press? This question came in. How was uh, the Indian government, you know, promoting space advocacy in among school children? And how are, how is the government, you know, involving, ISRO involving uh, uh, the, the, the students in India? And that was where the whole basis of, you know, International Space Society came in. And uh, we formed this society along with, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Suresh Nayak, who is a former group director, ISRO, and has worked on uh, at the Ahmedabad Center. And uh, he's almost 80 and still, you know, the kind of popular popularization of space science and space advocacy uh, is doing through the International Space Society. So that's where, you know, these guys came into picture and they were students and they had, uh, they were very interesting and uh, very enterprising. And we were having a, a conference, you know, the National Conference on Space, where almost 35 uh, scientists from ISRO were flying there at night, you know, doing this session with almost 10,000 students we, who, who, who were attending this conference spread over three days. And uh, of course, it was not possible for, for, for us to 
uh, share their the, the research what what uh, these young students were doing but they continued to be in touch and uh, uh, over the years uh, i got to know about saurabh and, and and trust me you know the, the spirit with which they they were pursuing their passion and and the kind of projects they were working in uh they came up with this idea in uh, a couple of years back two years back to come up with this uh, uh think lab and i said uh, i mean i was looking at an innovation and think lab and i had two two things in mind being being into education one was the spirit of entrepreneurship the other was innovation so that's where we started uh and i said please go ahead and uh, let's set up the first lab at uh, dikshan and let's associate and start spreading in uh, other schools also and that's where this this whole idea of you know development of uh, 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 the, the 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 balloon uh, satellite came in so they started with uh, a can satellite the students have made a made made a can satellite and there were trainers from uh, smart circuits saurabh and, and uh, all all his team and the next was the balloon high altitude balloon satellite which we successfully you know uh, launched almost uh, last year in last year in april it's almost a year so there are yeah. two two things you know it's almost a year that we we launched this high balloon altitude uh, satellite successfully and became the first school in the country to do it and the first lab to do it in the country and the the, the second year is that uh, second thing is that international space society completes 10 years today i mean around around the 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 uh, uh, for it was around uh, the 10th of may so we almost 10 years okay awesome. well can i interject one thing uh, i just want to share with you as i had the opportunity after uh, visiting with all of you i went to the united kingdom and to a place manchester in southford england and i was invited to go and visit one of the maker spaces that they're trying to build there and and give a few talks and at one of the university classes that i visited were just starting the process of building a small instrument and payload that they could put up in a weather balloon and send up into space and or up to the edge of space as high as they could go and the atmosphere and i told them all about you and told them all about the work that you all are doing uh, and they were so excited and at some point i would i'd i'll try to connect you with them so that the lessons that you learned would be something that can inspire and help them so so that this innovation in innovative lab you know the think lab has i mean both the things you know combined because the spirit of entrepreneurship which comes from you know innovation in the lab and also about you know i mean all all the innovations which are happening in in the, in, the, in the lab and uh, i mean the kind of projects uh, these kids young kids are working on uh i mean it's it's been a great experience you know seeing them working on oh, the innovation i mean saurabh can talk talk more about you know innovations which are happening in this lab <coughs> and uh, but one thing is clear that uh, i mean it's important uh for schools to 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 probably come up with something you know which which is going to i mean it's 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 a long term uh uh Uh, approach i mean i mean thought for uh, uh making these young students think about you know innovation as well as entrepreneurship taking those innovation i mean they've been they've been designing uh, drones they've been uh, making uh, telescopes on 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 their own uh, at the lab and it's 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 great to see see the kind of you know innovative ideas these these young kids uh, uh are involved with that it's it really is and i'm we're experiencing uh, the same thing and uh, well in my lab we have nasa scientists engineers and folks coming into this space it's on the nasa center and they're coming up with ideas that they think students will be able to embrace and take and that and those ideas we shared to help people if you're struggling with other ways of using 3d printers or coding electronics you're trying to come up with that next idea our scientists and engineers are trying to help you with that and they're coming up with additional thoughts and ideas things that they may not have done yet that they think that students that are in classrooms like you're describing and in other innovation labs and outposts 
uh, would be able to do. And so we're going to try to help that way as well. Um, and then I have to tell you, and I won't go into the details of this, there'll be more to come from our uh, website, which uh, we'll share that with you as well at Steam Innovation Lab, I think, .org, O-R-G. And you'll be able to find those ideas that are listed there. Um, but we're getting ready to launch this year, and we've been talking already to you about this, uh, the Outpost Network. And what that is, is basically the Steam Innovation Lab that we have is just one place. But we would like to be able to encourage other people to have this experience in their schools, maker spaces, everywhere from anybody that has two or three pieces of technology in their home that they would like to learn how to use better or, or all the way up to people that have thousands of people in their maker spaces as they open back up after COVID, uh, fingers crossed. Um, then uh, we're going to, we have a way for people in the very near future to join online and become part of a much bigger community of people doing everything you're talking about. And that, if you heard us talking earlier, me talking about this before, you'll all be listening right now, is uh, what we were mentioning that, uh, you know, Dickshon School and with the innovative labs that Sarab and Smart Circuits are working on are going to be the first international outposts that we have from our NASA STEAM Innovation Lab. And uh, that is still very real and happening. And we're working through all the processes now to get all of this back end programming and the network up and running. And we'll be testing that very soon and be in touch with all of you uh, to, be, to be a part of that and to really be a flagship part of that. I'm excited about that. I want to make sure I didn't forget to say that. Thank you. Sure, sure thank you. I'll, I'll, another thing, you know, uh, and there's some <coughs> interesting things, you know, a couple of years back, unfortunately, Dr. Uh, Abdul Kalam is no more. But uh, one of the packs that we started with the International Space Society and the National Space Society coming in uh, was about the space agencies, all the major space agen agencies, you know, coming up with a knowledge bank of uh, solar-based uh, uh, energy power. And uh, there were student ambassadors. And because, you know, the kind of statesman uh, Dr. Kalam was, and he, he, he got the Space Pioneer Award that year. And we, we were working nice. and we had student ambassadors, you know, who were working to create this, this knowledge bank and getting all the, the, the space agencies to come together. Nice, that's amazing. I, when I hear that kind of support coming together, especially when it impacts learning and student involvement at an early age, it just excites me because we need that energy. We need, we need that beautiful energy from our young people uh, to keep, keep everything inspired that's going on uh, with space because you're our next generation, you know? Not only the next generation, meaning we're gonna disappear from my generation and our generation currently there, we're gonna be there helping you. We're gonna be the old people with all the knowledge that's gonna be there in the background helping you even become better at what you, what you do. And I truly believe uh, it's through innovative projects like we're collectively working on right now that will inspire in, in the generations coming up right now, people, somebody alive on this planet is going to be the first person to walk on Mars. Uh, I really believe that we're working uh, in the world to do that. So I'm excited to know who it's going to be and what country they're going to be from. We, we don't know that because our astronauts come from all over the world uh, that, that we work with. And so it, it could be somebody from India, from the United States, you know, from Australia. We don't know, but it will be one of you. I'm going to plug in my uh, computer again. <laughs> sure. So uh, many students are asking that how we can learn, you know, about the new courses, whether it is related to space technology, astronomy, or robotics. So Mittal sir, what you will suggest, I mean, in this lockdown period, uh, how students can learn about these courses? I mean, whether they can go ahead with the online courses uh, if they want to learn about robotics or space technology in this lockdown period? I think I, I think smart circuits is already already in the process. I mean, you you guys are already in the process of starting with these online courses. I mean, uh, I I don't know what's the status because we discussed about it. Have you have you have you put yeah. these courses online? Yes, we have a lot of courses. I mean, uh, online courses for a school student, so they can learn robotics, space technology, astronomy uh, online in this lockdown period. So if you wish, you are interested for all these type of uh, courses, you can go. That's the best way of, you know, uh, making more, the most out of, you know, this lockdown period. Because, you know, it's something, you know, online learning is something, you know, which, which we'll have to accept as a way of life. Because uh, 
till the time you know there's no vaccination even the schools uh the the relevance i mean there's no way that you can open up open the schools without you know either either having staggering classrooms or then also you know if you have uh, i mean it's too early to comment upon it right now but we would have to go online for or all 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 our learning needs so i think it's a great idea if if people could could have access these students could have access to these online courses and uh, uh, and probably make the most out of it because i personally speaking i don't know i don't know where when when the classrooms are really going to open so i mean that's the best way of you know probably reaching out uh, to, to making the most out of this lockdown definitely so we were signing we uh, smart cities innovation private limited have uh, started a few uh, online courses sorry you are not audible you might have frozen for just a little bit um while he's on there i have to while he's working that out i i can definitely tell you that we're in the same boat we're trying to figure out uh when it's safe to open our classrooms and our libraries and museums and it, it could be quite some time it just it really depends on where the curve is and uh but right now as with you the online learning systems that our educators have been doing and coming up with as quickly as possible is extraordinary and something that's also extraordinary is parents who have no teacher training uh, so to speak are becoming our teachers now and they're learning the hard way you know they're they're having to work with their students here in the United States as well and they're they're looking online for new ideas and innovations that they can have their kids do as projects so Definitely. things like that you're doing and things that we're doing here in the steam innovation lab are, are really important especially in times like this and i hope we can get enough information out there to help them the, the urgency is right now and as uh, sarab was on my i started on my facebook page on my personal facebook page a little show to talk about the steam innovation lab and education technology applications uh once a week every thursday uh and he came on and talked about the balloon launch that you did at your school and talked about the the bamboo innovation that they did with the lamps and lights it was inspiring and and i'm hoping uh i can't wait to get that package with the bamboo lights that you've been creating so that i can inspire people to do something similar here and to add sensors to those lights so that when they are handed out you can collect data on uh the the climate on the atmosphere on water levels and and a mult uh, light pollution multiple numbers of things apart from just being a beautiful lamp you can carry i think that's that's exciting that's it sounds like a simple innovation but it's not it's actually it's a brilliant way to become a citizen science and scientist and collect data from, to help your community and the people right around you right now and i think that's incredible okay so sir uh, before we can proceed actually we have more than 3000 questions right now with us <laughs> and uh, so it is not possible for us to i mean ask each and every question so uh, so let me tell you more about the student innovation uh, challenge 2020 so we have received around 7500 ideas wow that's that's amazing <laughs> and uh, students from more than 15 countries uh, participated in this particular competition and the students from uae india nepal bhutan usa uk iran singapore they have participated in this particular competition so we have around 7500 uh, entries for the same and out of this 7500 uh, innovative ideas which is related to a covid-19 space technology new and innovative technology our team member has segregated the ideas and they have reviewed the ideas with the help of our mentors and all so today uh, we are going to announce the top 10 uh, firstly we will announce the top 10 uh, innovators and and after that we will also release the list of top 100 innovators out of 7500 uh, the innovators which we have received and our team will also guide to to those uh, top 100 uh, people also but right now in this session uh, we will only uh, tell the name of top 10 and after that we will release the top 100 innovators list on our website as well as on our, on our uh, facebook page so i request uh, mr mithul dikshit to please uh, announce the name of a uh, student from ranking from 4 to 10 and after that yeah uh, <clears throat> so at the 10th position we have 
Sudvik Sudvik Tagore from James International School, and uh, I mean he's a grade fifth student. And uh, then we have, I mean, there's a lot of variation in terms of he's the youngest uh, to have to have won uh, the the prize. Then at the ninth position is Bhubnesh Jain from Army Public School. He's standard eight. We have uh, Nila Bhadra Guha from Krishnanagar Public School, a grade nine student, who stands at the eighth position. We have Arshpreet Singh, DAV Pakhowal. Who's a great 11th student? At the sixth place, we have Jashandeep Singh, who's from Dikshan Global School, and a student of grade 10th. Adi Dhaya, who's from Delhi Public School, a grade 8th student, is at the fifth place. And we have Divyanshi Gupta from the Prudent School, grade 7th. So I think. Uh, uh, Troy, you have to announce the third, I mean, first okay. three students. Oh, but yeah, so before, yeah, so before that, I mean, uh, so after that, uh, firstly, I will uh, like to congratulate to each and every participant that is a 7,500 students. So definitely a big clap from our side for all, uh, all the students, uh, 7,500 youngster students, those who have submitted the innovative ideas. And uh, so for from our side, Our side, each and every student is a winner. Those who have participated in this particular, uh, you know, the competition. But as a part of rules and regulation, we have to come up with the first and second and third position. And apart from that, uh, we will also release the list of top 100 innovators also uh, after this session on our website as well as on our Facebook page. And uh, and after that, uh, after the announcement of first, second, and third, I will take one or two more questions. And after that, we will, um, I mean, uh, leave this uh, session. So may I request uh, Mr. Troy, uh, Director NASA STEAM Innovation Lab Before, to, yeah. I, I, I just want to know, I mean, these top 10 students uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, since we are live, why don't you, I mean, once things open up, why don't yeah. you, Troy agrees to it, give them an opportunity to come to, to, to visit the NASA STEAM, STEAM uh, Innovation Lab and maybe uh, work out on a on a visit uh, and let them work for i mean if troy i'm, I'm sorry Troy. absolutely that... yes no absolutely i would i would love that we would we'd really roll out the red carpet for you thank you very much so it's, it's, it's i think thank it's you very much idea. yeah so now i like to request to um mr troy uh, sir uh, director of nasa steam okay. innovation lab godard space flight research oh center goodness. to please announce a uh, first second and third position starting with the third position Okay. Well, I have to say, like what I just saw here uh, is we have a tie for third place, and uh, and I'm, I'm excited. This is amazing, and and also with the show that I'm doing every Thursday, I was talking to Sarab earlier. Uh, if it's possible to work with you in the future, we we could have uh, even students from any of the the top ten uh, to, to come on for a few minutes to explain their projects or you explain the projects with them or however you'd like to, but I would really welcome that. That would be an honor. So in third place, um, and pardon if I mispronounced some of the names, we, I practiced a little bit earlier. Uh, the first, the tie for third place is Shankar M. Madhuwalar from GHPS Shabi and from the sixth level, as far as in, in sixth grade on here, congratulations to that. I can't wait to see more of your work. And then we have Anjali, who is also tied for third place from Big Durrani High School uh, Bidar from the eighth level. And then in second place, I can feel the excitement and the nerves from people all over <laughs> the world who are listening to this right now. So um, I can even feel it, I'm excited for you. So second place is Naveen Kati and from SBM Sola High School on ninth level. Congratulations to you, that's quite an honor. I, I can't even imagine how brilliant you must be to get a second place along the top 10. These, this is just amazing innovation and brilliance. And first place, and we have a drum roll in the background if we're ready yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, are you ready for this? So first place is uh, Shivam Makhjari from Amity International uh, School, Pushap Binhar, New Delhi from the ninth level. 
And if I mispronounce that name, please correct it. But congratulations, I'm so excited. Yeah, definitely. And the good thing is that the Shiva Mukherjee from Amity International School, he made a device uh, on a COVID-19 uh, solution. Actually, he gave a solution related to COVID-19, uh, social distancing mm -hmm. and all these things. And all these students have submitted their ideas related to how they can maintain a social distancing uh, in this particular pandemic of COVID-19. They have submitted the ideas related to uh, space technology. Uh, many students have submitted the ideas related to uh, space uh, settlement designs and all these things. And a few students have submitted a new and innovative uh, ideas related to agriculture field or a healthcare sector. So we have received a wide range of, uh, you know, uh, ideas. Uh, uh, I mean, Uh, moreover, uh, through this live uh, session, I request to Mithul sir as well as uh, Mr. Toy sir, uh, we can also plan. Uh, we can also plan some, uh, you know, international challenge in near future, so that I mean, student uh, from school as well as the university, they can participate in that particular challenge. We can develop the challenge uh, through NASA STEAM Innovation Lab as well as the Innovation Lab or the Think Lab in Dikshan School. And the top uh, one or two or five students, I mean, will come up with a real-time uh, solution of the problem faced by society these days. And together, uh, NASA STEAM Innovation Lab and the Innovation Lab or the Think Lab in the Shan School students, they can, together they can work on that particular project. So uh, I'm sure, I mean, we can work out on this idea in the future and we can um, go ahead with some uh, international level challenge uh, for students uh, uh, with the help of uh, mentors like you and Amitul sir. Absolutely, I'm excited to be part of that. I absolutely encourage that and uh, as especially as the Outpost Network develops. I, I can't wait. I have to tell you, we have a partnership uh, you may have heard of, and I think I told you about, with the International Society of Technology and Education, and we call it ISTE, I-S-T-E, and they do uh, standards for education technology. Uh, incredible group, and they have just a huge wide range of audience. They are working with us right now in our Outpost Network to create the communication side of how we're all going to be uh, communicating ideas back and forth with each other as outposts and people, even if you're not an outpost and just a participant that's excited, uh, you can also join and be part of this whole thing, but we'll bring that information to you as well. Definitely. So sir, before leaving, I have two more questions. One question is that many students are asking they want to become an astronaut. So is there any suggestion or a guidance from them? You know, it, and it's different, uh, it's different around the world uh, with the different astronaut programs that are in existence. And with the United States, there is a place, if you visit the nasa.gov website and you type in uh, astronaut education or uh, just type in uh, becoming an astronaut, there is a process that um, anyone can submit. And there are times where it's open for you to submit to, to apply to become an astronaut. And astronauts aren't, um, they're not just engineers or only scientists. I mean, I don't mean that in any, any uh, negative way. They, there are other career levels of different things that people do, different kinds of science. Uh, they sent, you know, teachers into space. I knew one of the teachers uh, that went into space on a space shuttle, and her name was Barb. Her name was Barb, Barbara Morgan, and uh, she's a teacher like I am, an educator like I am, and she was became an astronaut and went to space and went through the whole training program. So yeah, absolutely. You, um, whatever field that you're passionate about, that you think you'd like to pursue, whether it's science, medicine, technology, the arts, mathematics, whatever it is, pursue that with everything you have. Be the best that you can be at it. And then if you also would like to be an astronaut or work at a place like NASA or space agencies in other countries, by all means, uh, apply because they're always looking for good people like that. Uh, I thought of, if I had the chance to be an astronaut, even now I would jump on it uh, in a million years. I often get asked the question, have you been to space? I'm like, uh, no, the closest I've been is uh, in a very high altitude jet. <laughs> I almost was able to get on the Concorde one time and that, that came close and it didn't happen. But if ever I had the opportunity, you know, I'd be right there and first in line to be an astronaut. And when I think about it, and this is kind of interesting, is um, all of us, so to speak, and this sounds crazy, but we're all astronauts to it in a way because we live on a planet that is hurling through space right now. This, this, the whole earth is a giant spaceship. Can you imagine one day if we were ever able to build anything that was like a sphere, like the earth with its own atmosphere? <laughs> I mean, that's what we live on. And it's going thousands of miles an hour through space right now as the sun, around the sun. And our entire solar system 
is hurling through space and the galaxy going even faster. So we all are on this journey together. So sir, uh, my last question is that, I mean, uh, many students are asking, uh, life is possible on moon or Mars in the near future? Uh, well, they are, uh, they're looking for signs of life on Mars and other worlds and other planets and moons right now. Um, as far as us living there, yes, it is very possible. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's almost, it's inevitable. We are going back to the moon and we are going to uh, be sending people to the moon. And as this progresses, we hope to, of course, expand that, have more and more people living and returning back and forth to Earth that live on the moon uh, over the next several years. And we also want to have a colony on Mars. Uh, that's very real. Uh, I hear scientists and uh, engineers talking about that quite often when I'm at Goddard. And there's a lot of work and planning that's been happening for quite some time about how we do that, how we get there, uh, what propulsion systems will we need. And uh, one of the biggest concerns that I've heard of is once we, let's say we have all the technology we need to live on Mars successfully, you know, like I love that movie with, was it Matt Damon? where he had to live uh, <laughs> on Mars and survive. I imagine one day it'll look very much like that. Um, uh, how he, the type of colony and the place that he lived, that would be what I would imagine this would look like. As a matter of fact, in the movie uh, that he was in that talked about living on Mars, our lead, pro one of our scientists, our lead science, uh, planetary scientist, Jim Green, uh, was one of the advisors. He's a good, he's a friend of mine. He was one of the advisors that helped them with the science fiction and the real science portions of that movie uh, to make sure that it was as accurate as possible within the realm of science fiction. And there was a lot of it that was very real uh, of things that we're thinking about how we would survive and what we would do. So the answer is yes. Uh, if life doesn't exist on those worlds now, it will within our lifetime from us. Definitely. So uh, it was really an you know, uh, interesting session. So before leaving, Mithul sir and Troy sir, do you want to say anything to our viewers? Mithul, would you like to start? No, no, you, you, you. Uh, Oh, thank you, thank you. No, I just, I, I am very inspired by all of the students that are listening and educators and parents and everyone listening right now. I'm very inspired by what we just witnessed. We just witnessed thousands of people around the world coming together for one purpose, and it was to accept this challenge and step up to the needs of today, including things that involve space and our current crisis that's happening here with a pandemic on, on the earth. And it, it, it is that kind of thinking, it's that kind of passion, that kind of love for innovation and growth that not only makes the world a better place, but makes the future a livable place and a habitable place that we can continue to love and enjoy for generations and generations to come. And with a little luck and lots of thinking and lots of good people, uh, we'll expand our presence not only on this world, but we hope to expand it to places like the moon and Mars and beyond that. Or maybe one day we'll live on uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, who knows. But the sky truly isn't the limit. Space is the infinity limit that we're going to be, be going for. It is beyond the sky. It is space that we're going to be exploring. And, and people have asked me often, uh, we have a lot of issues and problems here on this planet right now. Uh, why are we investing in going into space? And there are so many thousands of wonderful answers for that reason. It's because one at the very base of it is we're innovators, we're explorers. We see the stars, we want to understand them. We want to know them. We want to be, want to be part of that in a, in a physical way, if at all possible, or in, in a visual way. Um, but the other part of it is, is in our endeavor to live and grow in space and understand our space environment, and even understand our earth environment, like the regions of the depths of the ocean that uh, so much of it has been unexplored and we're exploring and trying right now. Um, that is the type of drive that it takes to create multiple innovations that are spinoffs that make life on earth better every single day. Everything from medical devices, uh, all the way down to the type of mattress that you sleep on because somebody had to invent a mattress that jet pilots could use as they were going to several Gs and astronauts can use as they're experiencing G forces. And that technology was eventually transformed to everyday use. And now we have mattresses being made out of the same type of material and even better. So it's that kind of drive. I wanna leave you with, um, with just the final word is passion. 
whatever it is that ignites your heart and makes you want to get up every day, um, pursue that with everything that you have. Do it. Try it. Even if it doesn't work out in the direction that you had hoped, don't let it go. It's that hope and that dream that not only for you, but the people around you who see that passion in you will become inspired by you. And you can become an ambassador, you know, a piece, an ambassador of science, an ambassador of technology and STEAM education, just because of your passion. So I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Middle sir, do you want to say anything before leaving? I think uh, we have another example of, you know, I wanted to uh, try to share his story about which, which he'd shared with me about how, how, how he was fascinated by the, these stars and uh, the way her grandmother took, took him out and holding uh, his hand. I mean, if you have, if you're passionate enough to, to, to do what you want to, and trust me that it's, it's a very, very fascinating, uh, uh, the, the space science is really fascinating and uh, i hope uh, each of you i mean i mean the kind of uh, questions which i was going through there was some very interesting questions which we've not been able to take because the the kind of you know uh, traffic which is which which is there on the live page so i hope uh, uh, for the best for you and dream big and uh, pursue your passion and thank you saurabh Thank you, Troy. It's always lovely to, you know, to, to interact with you and uh, looking forward to another visit uh, back to India and uh, spending Sweet. more time over here. And uh, thank you, Saurabh, and thank you, thank you for, 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 for getting this conversation. Uh, and thank you, Troy. Stay safe. You're very welcome. Stay safe. Yeah, Thanks. so... So, so to all. So to all our viewers, we are going to put the result on our website uh, by today itself, as well as on a. a So we'll put the name of all the top 100 students on our website as well as the Facebook page. If you still face any problem, you can contact our team. Anytime. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Good night.